good to be back with you today. Uh, I missed y'all last week uh, desperately. Uh, not just the food, but I missed y'all. Um, still got a little ways to go with uh, some dental work, so uh, just keep me in your prayers with that. But uh, uh, no place I'd rather be on a Sunday, I can assure you, than right here. Uh, so, miss y'all. We'll be back in the book of John today. And the things we're going to look at today are tough, difficult things. It's one of those. If you remember, the book of John is about Jesus demonstrating his glory and demanding trust from his people. And we can see him doing both things in John chapter 6 in this, these 11 verses we'll look at today. We, did, we see him demonstrating his glory by how he fed the multitude. He fed the 5,000 or so more by the loaves and the fishes. And on the heels of that miracle, he demands the people's trust by saying and demanding that he is the bread of life. And as we come to the end of this chapter, we see how people respond to those revelations that he is the bread of life and he demands their trust. How do they respond to that? John 6, we'll read 11 verses today. John 6, 60 through 71. John 6, 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is to have no avail. The words that I have spoken to you, they are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose the twelve? And yet one of you is the devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Now there are many reasons, different reasons, why people won't or don't follow Jesus. For some, they've never heard of Jesus, so they can't follow the one they don't know. Others uh, have a hard time with those who claim to follow Jesus. You ever heard this excuse? Well, I don't go to church or I don't follow Jesus because of all the people that claim to follow Jesus. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. So others maybe misunderstand a particular passage of Scripture and they, they twist it and say, well, because the Bible says this or, uh, you know, I can't match this up and so I'm just not going to follow Jesus. Our story today has nothing to do with any of those. Here's a large group of people that we see turn away from following Jesus. But it wasn't because they never heard him or didn't understand him. They understood, understood him completely. But it's because they understood him, they turned and walked away. It's what he said, what Jesus took pains to explain that actually caused them to turn away and never follow him again. So our text confronts us with this Jesus and it brings us to a point of decision. Will we follow him or will we turn away too? And what we want to do this morning is look at five truths about Jesus in this conversation. And as we do that, we need to remind ourselves how we got to this point. John 6, 60. When many of his disciples heard it, notice that pronoun there. We want to circle that if we could. Heard it, and they say this is a hard saying. What is the this and what is the it? When they heard what, what caused them to say, nope, can't do that, not going to do that. Let's turn away and walk the other direction. What was the it that was so difficult for them to understand? Well, the first teaching was that Jesus 
claimed to be the bread of life. He says, you people aren't following me because of me. You're following me because you want me to feed you again. I fed you once. I did a supernatural miracle. And now you want this, another supernatural thing. You're, you're following me because of all the benefits of what you can get from me. But if I never do another miracle, are you going to follow me? You're looking for physical food, and what I'm offering you really is spiritual food. I am the bread of life. Stop chasing all those other things. Stop looking for satisfaction and all those other things. Stop trying to climb the corporate ladder. Stop, climb, stop trying to get that bigger house. Stop chasing after those things that will never really satisfy you. And look to me, the only one who can really ever satisfy you. Come to me, he says. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, come to me and come to me alone and leave all that other stuff off to the side. Forsake all those things and get satisfaction from me. They didn't like that. Can't we have all this other stuff and Jesus? Can't we look to other things to satisfy us other than Jesus? He says, no, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And if you can't do that, if you won't do that, Jesus says, you can have no part of me. Tough, tough, hard sayings. And not only that, but John 6, 44 says, the second thing they found difficult to swallow was, well, you're, Jesus, you're telling us to come to you, but we can't come to you unless your father draws us to you. Well, we don't like that either. 1 Corinthians 2.14 reminds us, as we looked at it a few weeks ago, that the natural person can't even understand the things of God unless they have the Spirit of God. So this truth that he's the bread of life, so they can only find life in him, and that the, only the Father can draw them to him, they didn't like that. That rubbed them the wrong way. And it rubbed them the wrong way so hard, they got up and they left. They left. John 66, 66 says, many of his disciples got up and followed him no more. This is a difficult saying. It's a hard saying. You see, Jesus was not one of these non-confrontational type of preachers. He told people the truth. And he let people do with that truth what they wanted. Here's the truth. They didn't like the truth, so they just turned around and left. You see, if we cannot stomach hard sayings like these, you know what? We're just like these people that left. We're not really his followers. You see, there are followers, and then there are real committed followers. See, there are those that kind of tag along for the ride when it's hip and cool and popular and easy, then it's a cool thing to do to follow Jesus. But when something difficult is said, when something hard is said, when trials come, you know what happens? They don't follow him anymore. The verse I'm getting ready to show you is a difficult verse. Something Jesus said. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. Wow. So these people that walked away from his teachings that says we can't stomach being you being the bread of life, we can't stomach this whole thing of you having the Father drawing us, they walked away according to what Jesus says they are not his disciples because they did not continue in his teaching. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus says that. So here the word brings us to a confrontational point. Is Jesus our pet? Is he our mascot? Is he our genie that we rub when we want something? Or is he our master and we submit to his teachings? That's what this passage is pressing on us. And what this passage does is it reveals five truths about Jesus and what Jesus teaches. And we'll try to have five applications to these things. Number one, 
Jesus is more concerned with committed followers than lots of followers. Let me say that again. Jesus is more concerned with committed followers than just having lots of followers. Now, this is a pretty pivotal point in the ministry of Jesus. He's got a huge crowd here, probably again, guesstimating 15 to 20,000 people here. Our mindset is this, when you're growing in popularity, that now is the time to seize it. Now is the time to capitalize on it. Now is the time to go national. Now is the time to get the website up and running, to get the brand, to get the logo up. I mean, they're ready to make him king. They're ready to enthrone him. Now is the time to move, we would say. Now is the time we would expect Jesus to turn to Matthew and go, okay, Matthew, we've got 15,000 people here. Uh, let's get everybody divided up into small groups. And uh, Barnabas, you, you, uh, you get the prayer chain going and, and get these people lined up here with that. And, and then he gives another disciple another thing to, to, to get going. But he didn't do that. As a matter of fact, he says hard things to thin the crowd out. That blows our minds, right? We think, what's he doing? If I'm a disciple, I'm like, no, Jesus, don't say that. Stop. They're all going to leave. What's he saying? He's saying by his example, he's more concerned with people being committed than just having lots of people around. I mean, is it bigger, better, Jesus? He says, no. You see, but we, in our, even in our society, carry around this idea that bigger is better. I mean, how many SUVs do you see on the road? How many Hummers do you see on the road? I mean, how many would rather have a 65-inch TV than a 40-inch TV? Bigger is always better. Houses, bigger is better. I mean, wouldn't it be better if we had more people here? I think that. I think, where's everybody at? Because bigger is always better. Jesus says, pump the brakes on that idea. I mean, wouldn't it be better if, if we had more in the choir because louder is better? Wouldn't it be better if we had 15 services spread out over Easter weekend? I mean, wouldn't that necessarily be better because it means more people? Jesus says, no, I'm not after lots of followers. I'm after committed followers. Now, that's not a knock on big churches. There are big churches that have committed followers. But here's the point. Jesus isn't nearly as consumed with numbers as we are. Because if he were, he would have kept those 15,000 around. You know, what Christ wants from us is increased levels of commitment from us. We must reject the idea, as tough as it runs against the grain of society, that bigger is better. You see, we've got to reject the idea that we do all sorts of crazy, zany stuff to get people in the pew. I've heard of youth pastors that would put peanut butter on their bodies just to get people in the, in, the, in the youth room. We've got to reject that idea because you end up watering down the message and you won't say difficult and hard things. We must remember this very truth, that the gospel is an offense to people who have not believed. It is foolishness to them who have not believed. But to us, it's the power of God. I mean, if you want to attract great crowds, get rid of the cross. Turn Jesus into your personal self-help genie. Turn Jesus into your personal finance guy. And that he's there to bless you financially and take care of everything. And I mean, you want a crowd, start preaching that. Because you'll draw a crowd. Because you know what you're doing is you're promoting their own idols. I mean, who doesn't want to be rich? Who doesn't want nice stuff? You turn Jesus into that, you're just feeding their flesh. I mean, who doesn't want that? And I want to tread very lightly in what I'm fixing to say 
as my wife cringes because I was preaching this to her yesterday. One of the largest churches in Stanley County, I listened slash watched their Easter message. And I'm not long-winded, but this one was only 23 minutes long. And in the first 13 minutes of that 23-minute message, I never heard Jesus, the cross, the resurrection, nothing. Man, you want to get me fired up, do that. No cross, no resurrection, no sin, no nothing. And then when the gospel was presented, it was believe in Jesus and have an overcoming story. Be a comeback story like Jesus. You want your own comeback story, follow Jesus. Hello, that is not the gospel message. Jesus died for our sins, rose on the third day that we might live forever with him. Jesus did not die to give me a comeback story. The gospel is so much more than that. And how dare they do that to the gospel? But yet, because they've got a huge crowd, they must be doing something right. Folks, what gospel are they believing if that's the gospel presentation? We can never remove the cross, the offense of the cross, that man is lost before a holy God, but Christ has come to bridge that separation gap. Bigger does not always mean better. Bigger is just bigger. Christ is after committed followers. And they didn't want that commitment, so they left. Point two, Jesus reserves the right to confound his followers. Jesus reserves the right to confound his followers. So they come to him and they say, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? We've got this. So now Jesus has this huge crowd and now they're complaining. That's why bigger isn't always better. The more people, the more grumbling. So they're complaining now and they're confounded. They say, we don't even know what you're talking about, Jesus. What do you mean I... These, they're confounded. This is hard. We can't do this. We don't want to do this. Then here's the temptation I would face. I'd want to pacify the crowd. Let's just give them what they want. Let's just make them happy. Let's just, whatever, let's just give them more fish. Let's just, you know, here, take it. Bring me some more bread. Bring me some more fish. And here, just have this. Let's do what we can just to make them happy. And yet, he says in verse 61, does that, that bother you, he says? You, you taking offense at this? Does that, does that bother you? Is that hard for you? You think that's bad. We'll get to this point in a second. You think that's bad. Something worse than this is coming. If you think my saying is bad, this, this is just going to get worse. And then he tells them. He tells them. There are some of you who haven't believed. Oh, you may think you're following me, but you haven't really believed. Well, they really didn't like that. So they're grumbling and complaining, hey, this is why I told you. No one can come to him unless it's granted me by the Father. I mean, he's just, he's just piling on at this point. They're confounded. They're confused almost. They're upset. So he just keeps piling on. Oh, yeah? You haven't even believed. And you're not going to believe unless you're, it's granted by my Father. Whew, it just makes it worse. You see, Jesus asserts his right to say things we don't understand. Jesus spoke words that left them scratching their head going, what? Bread of life, why? I don't need to do that. Come to you? What are you talking about? Has that ever happened to you? You've looked at scripture or you've had a situation in your life and you're like, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Parents, have you ever done this to your children? Son, trust me, this is in your best interest. And the child's like, I don't understand that. Why do I got to be home at 11 o'clock? That don't make any sense to me. Why well, I got to be home at a certain time? That, that, why is that rule there? That's foolish. Hey, kids, your parents love you. That's why they're doing things that you don't understand. And Jesus loves us, and he confounds us, and he does things that we don't always understand. And that's okay. You see, the master knows exactly what's going on. <laughs> we don't. 
He sees the big picture. He's the boss. Have you ever asked that question, why? Why am I out of this job? Why am I in the hospital? Why this? Why that? Job asked that question a lot in his book. And his, he and his friends sat around and tried to figure it all out. And there were times when Job was high. He said, you know, uh, he was, hey, naked I came into this world and naked I'll go out. Man, whatever God wants to do, God can do. And there were times when he was low. And he said, the day I die will be better than the day I was born. And God could have answered his question, why? Hey, Job, come here, let me tell you. The devil was talking, and I, I thought you, we, I could show you off, and I know you're going to follow me. And Job, here's why. God never did that with Job. He left Job confounded. He never tells Job why. He just tells him who. Finally, God has had enough, and God says, oh, big fella, where were you when I put the oceans only so far? Where were you when I flung the stars by the word of my mouth? Where were you, Job? And then Job, two chapters in, repents in dust and ashes and says, oh, God, I'm so sorry. God says, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. And then goes on for two more chapters, telling him how great and how big God is and puts Job in his place. You see, God is our master. You see, if Jesus is the master, then we give up our demand to understand before we trust. I mean, here I was laying in the hospital bed last, Saturday, or last Sunday morning at 5 a.m. Hadn't slept a wink all night. Those beds aren't the most comfortable beds in the world. Can I get an amen from my nurses? It's 5 a.m. And I said, man, the guys, the guys are getting there to cook. Man. Now, I know I would have got there and they would have ragged on me as they ragged on everybody else, but uh, I was like, man, I would really, and then it got to be six o'clock, seven o'clock. And I knew everybody was gathering right over here looking at that beautiful sunrise. And I was in the hospital bed. Couldn't even have any food at that point. But you know what? God had me right where he wanted me and will continue to do so in the coming days. Didn't understand it. Don't understand it. Do you know enough about God to trust him? Do you know enough about God to trust him? You see, if we were to know the reason behind everything, it would probably blow our minds sometimes. And sometimes it might not even be about us. Maybe they have you to certain spots so you can impact that doctor, impact that nurse, impact that receptionist for the sake of the gospel. So Jesus is more concerned about Committed followers and lots of followers. Number two, Jesus reserves the right to confound his followers. Number three, Jesus alone has the words of life. Verse 67, do you want to go away as well? Gee, Peter said, man, where are we going? <laughs> You're it. You've got the words of life. We got nowhere else to go. Jesus' very words brings life. They are life-giving words. See, this is why believers follow Jesus. We don't always understand. But where else are we going to go? Where are you going to go? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. His words bring life. And no matter what, we're just staking our claim on him like Peter. Lord, we've got nowhere else to go. Lord, you're it. We see we turn away from other voices, maybe even voices in our life if they speak contrary to his truth and his word. That's what David did. David went out and danced in the street. His wife gave him a hard time. He said, be quiet. I'm dancing before the Lord. Job's wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? No, nope, can't do that. That's contrary to God's word. See, we... We only get our counsel from Jesus and we hear from Jesus. We don't turn on Oprah. We don't listen to Dr. Phil. We don't listen to Dr. Oz. We get our life-giving words from Jesus Christ because only he has the life-giving words. Before we move on to this next point, we look at Peter and what well, that's pretty good for Peter. That's pretty good. Don't we think that, 
Lord, whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So we think Peter's in a good spot, but actually he's not. Matthew 16, Jesus asked Peter, hey, Peter, who do men say that I am? He goes, well, some say you're John the Baptist and some say you're Elijah. He says, no, Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, well, you're the son of God, the Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus commends him, says, you're right, Peter. Now, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My father did, but that's, that's a good answer. Here, he doesn't say that. He doesn't uh, answer this. In a, he doesn't say, oh, Peter, that's so good, Peter. Man, I'm so proud of you. No, because he sits a little pride in Peter. A little bit of, hey, Jesus, everybody else is bailing on you, man, but we're, I'm sticking it out. Everybody else is gone, but I'm here. I mean, everybody else is gone, but I, I'm going to stick it out because you're the man. He says, now, Peter, the next fourth point that Jesus teaches is that Jesus chooses us. Jesus answered them, did I not choose? Whoa, Peter, 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 you think you're following me because you're smarter than everybody else? You think you're following me because you're just flat out more committed than everybody else? Peter, let me remind you of this truth. Did I not choose you, Peter? Did I not choose you, Peter? And if we think that verse is tough, John 15, 16 is even more difficult. He tells the disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you should go and bear fruit. You see, this should work. This truth should work humility in us. Humility, a humble people. That unless God has done something in us, we can do nothing. Maybe you are committed, but you know why you're committed? You're committed because of the grace of God operating in your life. That's why. That's why. We must follow him in humility. None of us deserve anything ever. None of us are better than anybody else. We can't look down on anybody else like Peter probably was standing there with his hands in front of him going, Lord, we're not going to leave you like all those other people left you. We're here for the duration. Yeah. Look at those losers walk away. Not us. We're committed. We can't, you know, we've got to respond to each other with humility. Not shocked or dismayed when someone sins because we've probably sinned in a different way the same day a humble people, that God has done a marvelous work of grace in our life. We can't be high or haughty or think, well, we're having that Elijah complex that, well, I'm the only one following Jesus around here. No, it's an act of grace that God gives us. Fifth point, Jesus' ascension is the supreme scandal. Verse 62 then what, do you think what I just said is hard? Bread of life, you've got to be drawn to me. Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Now we see this and on the surface we think, well, you know, if they see Jesus on the Mount of Olives ascending, man, people are going to believe that. That's a supernatural thing here. But his ascension here is referring to his entire complete work. His death, his burial, and his resurrection and his ascension. He goes, you think what I've said is hard? How are you going to respond when you see the Messiah beaten and hanging on the cross? That's a scandal. That's a scandal. And that's how they responded. That can't be the Messiah. We don't want him. We want a king. Crucify him. Crucify him, he says. That's a scandal. He goes, you think these, a couple of these, these things were hard that I said to you? Where do you see me beaten, crucified, and hanging on the cross? Oh, it's going to get real then. It's going to get difficult then. If you can't handle this small teaching, you sure won't handle the big teaching. The scandal isn't eat my flesh, drink my blood, or the Father draws who he wills. No, the real scandal, according to Jesus, is his work of redemption. That the very Messiah, the very chosen one of God, would have to die on an old rugged cross. Ah, who would have to do that? Why would the Messiah have to do that? Oh, no, that's not our king. If 
you're not going to believe that, you won't believe this. But it says, if you believe that, the ascension, you believe my work, you believe that I died for you, that I rose for you, you'll believe anything I tell you. He's working from the lesser to the greater. You see, the place we're being squeezed into, a place of simply believing his work, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Have you believed that? Have you believed the gospel? Have you believed that Jesus died in your place? That you desperately need a mediator before God? That you can't get to God on your own? You'll never be good enough, moral enough, never give enough to get to God on your own. You need Jesus' work on the cross, being your mediator, being your substitute to pay your sin debt. That's the gospel. Have you believed that? Say, so maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I believe that. I believe I'm not good enough. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. <clears throat> I believe he's my substitute, my mediator before God. Here's my question. Are you committed? Are you committed? Say, so, Pastor, what do you mean? Hey, look at your pocketbook and look at your time. Look at your pocketbook and look at your time. There's lots of avenues I could go right there. But I'm not. I'll let the Spirit of God do His work. Are you committed? Are you committed? Are you willing to follow Christ when hard things are said, when Jesus says hard things or bring hard things to into your life? Or will you walk away and go, that's just too hard, can't follow him, not going to follow him, don't want that Jesus, don't want that Jesus. Jesus loves you. Jesus knows what's best for you. And if you're committed to him, you'll be committed to his words. And you'll trust him no matter what he brings your way. Will you be committed to Christ today? Let's bow in prayer. As the musicians come, I'll ask this question. Where is your heart today? Maybe you're struggling because you've got some difficult circumstances in life. You've got difficult circumstances in life. And the master has brought something your way that you're struggling to trust him with. You want to trust him, but your faith is weak. Maybe you need to come today and, and pray. And pray and seek God's face. That he would increase your faith, increase your trust. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. Oh, you haven't believed. Oh, you've... Oh, you've been on the outskirts, but you've never really believed. You've, you believe you're a pretty good person. You believe you're better than most, but that's not the standard. Maybe you need to come to Christ today and believe he paid your sin debt and took your place on the cross. Maybe you're here today and you're a member of this church and you're a Christian, but maybe you're just not committed. Maybe you're not all in. And you can demonstrate that lots of ways. But you know, and God knows. <sighs> Father, take your word. We thank you for the hard things that you tell us. Father, if we know you say hard things because you love us. And you're molding us and shaping us. You desire us that we follow you. That we're committed to you. Father, help us to align our thinking with Scripture where we're struggling. Father, for the one that's going through a hard place here today, Lord, that they would just trust in you. In spite of the circumstances, what they see, may they, by faith, Lord, trust what you're doing. Father, they may be confounded, but Father, help them not to walk away. Help them not to walk away. For the one here today, Lord, maybe they're not a Christian. Maybe they don't know you. Father, would you draw them to the work of your son? Father, if they here today and they, they, they walk out unsaved, Father, I pray that you would make them uncomfortable by your spirit. That you would con continue to woo and, and draw them to yourself. 
Father, whatever our need is here today, would you meet that need? In Christ's name I pray. Amen.